How's it going everyone? This is MedCat and today we're going to go over how to draw the biochemical structure of DNA and a little bit about why it's important to know for the MCAT. First things first, whenever we're drawing DNA, we need to start with a ribose sugar ring. So let's start to draw that. This is our basic ring and then we have a fifth carbon coming off the left here as I've drawn. Now we want to be careful to make sure that we shade in a little bit thicker these front four carbons to denote the fact that they are kind of coming out of the page at us. So a little bit of the stereochemistry that we're looking at with there. Also, we need to know that in DNA, we are going to have this carbon have an OH group. However, this carbon will not. To explain that, we're going to need to explain also how we number the carbons. We're going to number the carbons based on a very basic numbering system, starting with our right side here. We'll label this carbon 1 prime, this carbon 2 prime, this carbon 3 prime, this carbon 4 prime, and finally this last one over here, 5 prime. This is actually how we label the polarity or the different sides of our DNA. If one side of our DNA has its five prime carbon exposed, that will be the five prime end. And if one side has its three prime carbon exposed on the end, that will be the three prime end of the strain of the DNA. So keep all those things in mind as we continue moving forward. One other thing we want to comment on is that because this two prime carbon does not have this alcohol or hydroxyl group, what we're going to be looking at is two prime deoxy, referring to deoxygenating that two prime, ribonucleic acid. And we should know that deoxyribonucleic acid, of course, is DNA. So DNA's quote unquote full name might be two prime DNA, referring to that two prime being deoxygenated rather than the three prime, for example. So that's all I want to say about ribose here before we continue on. Now let's go a little bit over how we want to draw out our five prime end here. So the five prime end will actually be attached to a phosphate group. And the phosphate group will have this double bond to oxygen, single bond to oxygen, negatively charged, a single bond to oxygen negatively charged. These will be negatively charged at physiological pH, which is about 7.4, by the way. And the reason for that is that the first two pKa's of phosphoric acid are actually going to be lower than this physiological pH of 7.4. If that isn't making any sense, that's going to be a concept also on the MCAT, specifically having to do with what we call the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation and I'll be making a video on that hopefully very soon. So that's 7.4 there. So this is our five prime side of our DNA, and that is referring specifically to that five prime carbon right here. This, what we've drawn right here, is one component of what we call our sugar phosphate backbone, where our ribose is the sugar, and then our phosphate obviously is our phosphate. The next thing we need to draw is one of our nitrogenous bases. That could be adenine, thymine, cytosine, or guanine. We're going to start with adenine because it generally is the most commonly referred to nitrogenous base, specifically because its role in adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. To draw this, we're going to have to go off of our one prime carbon on the ribose, and start with a nitrogen, of course, because we're looking at a nitrogenous base. And then we'll draw one carbon, a double bond to our next nitrogen, and then a double bond here. And because adenine is what we call a purine, it's going to have a two ring structure here. So we need to continue on. And a lot of this is just going to be rote memorization where you need to draw these structures out over and over again before you finally get them. And then keep in mind these nitrogens also have lone pairs on them. I just haven't drawn them out like I have right here. So this whole thing is the nitrogenous base adenine. Moving on, 
we need to know how we get from the five prime end all the way down to our three prime end. What we've drawn here is just one kind of iteration of DNA. But if we want to add on another iteration of our DNA, what we're going to have to do with an enzyme called DNA polymerase, which you should know from DNA replication, we are going to have to use a nucleotide, for example, something like GTP. So GTP will come in with that DNA polymerase and add itself on specifically to the three prime end of this DNA. And what we'll be left with is a guanine and a phosphate added on here, as well as a ribose, of course. And then we'll get our side product, a P, P sub I, or pyrophosphate byproduct. Therefore, only one of those phosphates is actually going to be retained in that DNA. So let's take a look at what that looks like now. The three prime end hydroxyl group will lose that oxygen and instead form part of what we call a phosphodiester bond here. With another phosphate. And this phosphate now will complex with a five prime of the next ribose ring. Therefore, we've drawn our next sort of iteration of a phosphate and a ribose ring. Okay, so we'll see phosphate, ribose, phosphate, ribose, etc. Now we have a proper three prime end of our DNA because our three prime carbon is exposed and is not locked up in this phosphodiester bond. By the way, it's called phosphodiester because this is an ester with a double bonded oxygen attached to some sort of central molecule here, usually a carbon and an ester, which is attached to an O with another carbon on the opposite side. But there are two of those ester functional groups because we have one on each side, therefore we call it a phosphodi, meaning two ester. Therefore, we've drawn out our five prime and three prime end. All we need to do to finish up this very short piece of DNA would be to add on another nitrogenous base. And for this one, we're going to draw out guanine, which is another purine, another two ring structure here. At first, it's going to look very similar to adenine. So up to this point, it's pretty much identical. However, in the next ring, that's where things start to diverge a little bit. We get a carbonyl carbon, which will form an amide bond. And then on this specific carbon here, we'll get an amine popping off as well. Okay. So this is guanine here, and this is adenine. Both are purines, but they have slightly different structures, of course. One thing I also want to mention before we go to the other strain of DNA is that this is a very short piece of DNA. And remember that DNA, especially in eukaryotes, which humans are, of course, eukaryotes, those strands of DNA are going to be extremely long, extremely long. So we're not going to see just a five prime and then only two bases. We're going to see hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of bases as we move on. I'm only drawing two of them just for simplification. Now, another thing we want to remember about DNA when we draw our next strand is that DNA is anti-parallel. In other words, if we have our five prime side up here, that means we need our three prime side on our other strand. And if we have our three prime side here, that means we need our five prime side strand over here as well. This is where it can get a little tricky, where we actually have to draw DNA a little bit upside down. And you'll see what I mean when we draw out our ribose ring here. So we'll draw out ribose. Here's our three prime carbon. And here, consequently, is our three prime end right here. Okay. And then we'll draw our five prime carbon, and then it being attached to a phosphodiester bond, of course. And we'll hold off on drawing the rest of that for right now. Okay. Because this is adenine, we should actually know what nitrogenous base needs to come off of here. We should know that it must be thymine, according to Chargaff's rules, because adenine always pairs with thymine, creating two hydrogen bonds, 
and cytosine always pairs with guanine, making three hydrogen bonds. Therefore, we need to draw out guanine now. Guanine will be attached to the one prime carbon with a nitrogen, just like adenine and guanine here. So we have a nitrogen, and then we form a one ring structure here because thymine in it, along with uracil and cytosine is an example of what we call a pyrimidine or a one ring structure. So carbonyl here, nitrogen, hydrogen, another carbonyl, and then finally we close up the ring. Now we have adenine and thymine. One of the last questions that we need to take a look at here is where actually these hydrogen bonds are being formed. Remember, for every hydrogen bond, we need a donor hydrogen and an electron acceptor pair. What we're going to look at are hydrogen bonds specifically between this hydrogen right here on the nitrogen and the lone pair on this nitrogen in adenine. So if we draw a red line representing that hydrogen bond, that's what that would look like. Next, we'll take a look at the hydrogen bond between this donor hydrogen, oops, this donor hydrogen and this oxygen right here. So we'll draw this out right here. So two hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine. That's gonna um, not contribute as much stability as the three hydrogen bonds that cytosine and guanine will contribute to uh, DNA bonding there. Moving on, we'll take a look at our phosphate backbone that we left off here. So another oxygen, and this oxygen will be attached instead this time to our three prime of our next ribose ring. So we have to be a little careful how we draw this. And then of course, we'll have our five prime carbon attached to the phosphate group, which we'll draw out and then we'll leave this end free and make it our five prime side. All right, now that we have our ribose ring, we need a nitrogenous base coming off of that C1 prime carbon on the ribose. And if this is guanine, we know that the corresponding base here has to be cytosine. Cytosine, if we draw it out, will be attached by a nitrogen, just as all of our previous nitrogenous bases have been nitrogen here, and then we'll draw it out slowly. We start off very similar to thymine, but where we get a little bit different here is we have a nitrogen instead double bonded to this carbon, and popping off of this carbon, we will have an amine. So that is a structure of cytosine. Now we also know that cytosine and guanine are going to have three hydrogen bonds between them. So what we need to do is figure out where those are. This amine is going to contribute a donor hydrogen and coordinate with the lone pair on this carbonyl oxygen. So we're going to look at something like this. Our next hydrogen bond will be between this donor hydrogen and the lone pair on this nitrogen. So we'll look at this here for our next hydrogen bond. And then finally, we'll take a look at this hydrogen on the free amine and the lone pair on this oxygen, which will create our final third hydrogen bond between our nitrogenous bases, guanine and cytosine. That's it for today's MedCat video. Feel free to hit the like button, subscribe, and check out my comprehensive amino acid playlist, which can be found in the link in the description below.